My name is Simone Thompson, and today I will be reading The Unstoppable Garrett Morgan by Joan DeSico, illustrated by Ebony Glenn. Clang, clang, clang. Young Garrett Morgan awoke to the sound of a ringing brass bell. He ran to the window and saw plumes of black smoke rising from the neighboring farm. He woke his younger brother, Frank, grabbed the water buckets and raced to help. These types of fires were common for sharecroppers like Garrett's parents. Their shacks were made of wood and tar paper and burned smoky hot and fast. If people were trapped inside, rescuers had nothing to protect themselves from poisonous smoke. By the time Garrett and Frank arrived, only a burned out shell of a house remained. As they walked back home, the gears in Garrett's clever mind turned, trying to think of a way to help. The son of freed slaves, Garrett was born in Claysville, Kentucky in 1877 the seventh of 11 children. As sharecroppers, the Morgans worked on land owned by a different family in exchange for a share of the crop at harvest time. After the cost of their housing, farm tools, and seed was subtracted from their share, they often found themselves in debt. Innovation became a way of life for Garrett. If his family needed something they didn't have, he figured out a way to make it himself. By the age of 14, curious and creative Garrett was restless for a better life. Segregation was strictly enforced in the South, leaving few prospects for African-Americans. Garrett went north to find greater opportunity. Garrett arrived in Cincinnati, Ohio with pennies in his pocket. Having just a sixth grade education and a few skills, he took the only job he was offered as a handyman for a wealthy landowner. Although he worked long days, Garrett never tired of learning. Each week, he set aside money for a private tutor and continued his studies. Four years later, Garrett moved further north, hoping to find a better job. Cleveland was becoming a major manufacturing center for the clothing industry. Throughout the garment district, workers used machines to make things that had been crafted by hand. It was here, with modern machinery whizzing and whirling, ticking and clicking, that Garrett's creative nature soared. While working as a janitor for a clothing manufacturer, Garrett noticed that the drive belts on the sewing machines became slack after a while and often broke. Broken machines frustrated the workers, whose pay depended upon the number of garments they produced. As he'd learned to do on the farm, Garrett solved the problem through his own innovation. He invented a simple but effective belt tightener that adjusted the slack and helped the machine run longer, smoother, and faster. Garrett's boss was so impressed by his creativity that he promoted Garrett to work as a repairman. It wasn't long before word got around that Garrett could fix just about anything. A competing manufacturer offered him a job and in 1906, Garrett became the company's first black machinist. There, Garrett met a German seamstress named Mary Hasek. Mary was equally bright, creative, and hardworking. Garrett and Mary were instantly drawn to each other, but black men were not permitted to talk to white female employees. Even as a simple conversation with Mary brought a stern warning from Garrett's supervisor. But Garrett wouldn't give up. By now, he had overcome so many obstacles that he lived by a motto. If a man puts something to block your way, the first time you go around it, the second time you go over it, and the third time you go through it. This way of thinking made Garrett unstoppable. To be with Mary, Gary figured out a way to go around the obstacle. He quit his job and opened a sewing machine repair shop. Mary admired Garrett's boldness. In 1908, Mary and Garrett were married. With Mary's skill as an expert seamstress, Garrett expanded the business and began manufacturing affordable clothing for Cleveland's growing black middle class. They named their business Morgan's Cut Rate Ladies Clothing. By 1909, they had 32 employees working on machinery built by Garrett himself. Ding, ding, ding. A fire engine's bell rang as a team of horses whizzed by. Their manes whipped in the wind like the flames racing through the building at the end of the block. The firefighters prepared to go in, holding their leather helmets in front of their faces to block the heat and smoke. Their efforts proved useless as they stumbled out, gasping for air. When Garrett heard about the tragedy, memories of the fires he had witnessed as a boy sparked to life. Though many years had passed, he realized that even big city firefighters lacked the equipment they needed to save victims. 
With the gears of his creative mind already turning, Garrett headed to his workshop, determined to find a way to help firefighters breathe in smoke-filled places. Garrett knew that smoke and deadly fumes rose with the heat of a fire, leaving a layer of fresh air near the ground. He needed to create a device that could capture this fresh air and lift it up for firefighters to breathe. He fashioned a heat-resistant helmet with two long tubes attached, one for inhaling, lined with a wet sponge to cool and filter the air, and one for exhaling, with a valve to keep the stale air from getting back in. The tubes joined halfway down the wearer's back and became one tube dangling close to the ground in the layer of breathable air. Garrett spent three years crafting and refining his invention. His brother Frank helped him test the different helmets. After countless long nights falling asleep at his workbench, Garrett finally succeeded. He called his new invention the safety hood. In 1912, Garrett applied for a patent, which gives an inventor the sole right to make, use, and sell an invention. When his patent was granted, Garrett entered the safety hood in the 1914 International Exposition for Safety and Sanitation in New York City. Wearing his device for protection, Garrett entered a tent filled with smoldering sulfur ammonia, tar, and remained there for more than 20 minutes. To the shock and amazement of the crowd, he emerged unharmed. The safety hood won the grand prize gold medal. Garrett traveled across the country, demonstrating the safety hood to fire departments. Many were impressed by the brilliant invention, but refused to consider the safety hood when they discovered Garrett was African-American. Determined not to let prejudice stop him, Garrett called upon his motto and went over the obstacle this time. He asked a white friend to pretend to be him while Garrett posed as his assistant modeling the hood. Some fire chiefs put the invention through their own rigorous tests, but the safety hood exceeded their expectations. Orders for Garrett's device flooded in. On July 25, 1916, Garrett Morgan and his safety hood would face the greatest test of all. Ring, ring, ring. Garrett's telephone rang in the middle of the night. An explosion had ripped through a tunnel at the Cleveland Waterworks, trapping workers in smoke and deadly fumes hundreds of feet below Lake Erie. One of the rescuers had seen Garrett's demonstration. Only the safety hood could save the man underground. With no time to waste, Garrett called Frank and raced to help. When Garrett arrived at the waterworks, he handed out protective hoods to the firefighters, police, and other volunteers. But the men refused to join him. Two other rescue parties went down and have failed to return, Mayor Davis said. Garrett knew time was running out. I'll take the chance, he said. Frank stepped forward. I'll go with you. A man named Tom Clancy spoke up. My father is in there. I will go. Another man volunteered as well. To his motto, Garrett Morgan went straight through the obstacle. Up on the surface, the crowd held its breath, waiting, hoping. Then, look, someone's coming out. It was Garrett Morgan with Tom Clancy's father. Moments later, Frank Morgan came out with another survivor. The crowd whooped and cheered. When Garrett and Frank prepared to go back into the tunnel, the crowd of volunteers grabbed safety hoods to join them. The next day, the story of the rescued man was front page news, but Garrett and his brother were not given credit for their bravery. Only the white volunteers were named and later awarded the Carnegie Medal for Heroes. Many people had heard of Garrett's heroic actions and grew angry that he was excluded. Dozens of businessmen and elected officials wrote letters to the Carnegie Foundation, asking them to correct the injustice. When the efforts didn't work, the Citizens Committee, a self-appointed group of community leaders, came together to acknowledge Garrett's achievements and service to Cleveland. They held a ceremony and presented him with a solid gold diamond-studded medal inscribed to Garrett, our most honored and bravest citizen. Garrett Morgan's desire to help people was a lifelong pursuit. If he saw a need for something, he used his ingenuity and resources to fill it. He continued to improve the safety hood, and in 1917, as the United States prepared to enter World War I, the safety hood was developed into a gas mask that saved thousands of American soldiers' lives. When Garrett and other black businessmen were barred from advertising in white-owned newspapers, he started Call, a newspaper in which African Americans could promote their businesses and read fair-minded news about the black community written by black reporters. After Garrett witnessed a terrible collision between a horse-drawn carriage and a motor car at an intersection, 
he invented a more effective traffic signal. In addition to telling drivers to go and stop, his patented device also included a stop all position that stopped traffic in all directions, allowing cars and pedestrians traveling in one direction to clear the street before traveling in the opposite direction again. With determination and courage, Garrett Morgan went around, over, and through every obstacle between him and his goal to help others. Today, his legacy is all around us. Whenever firefighters rescue people from smoke-filled buildings or motorists and pedestrians safely cross an intersection, we have a brave inventor to thank, the unstoppable Garrett Morgan. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Bedtime Buckaroos. See you next time.